If you're like me, the first time you were exposed to this movie, whether you were aware of it or not, was this exact moment in one of the strangest and most random references ever made in a TV show. Nosferatu! I grew up knowing the name Nosferatu just from quoting this episode of Spongebob, not knowing who the strange character was or what he was from. This gag was the brainchild of Jay Lender, a writer for Spongebob, who wrote it into the show just as a whimsical random reference, with no real purpose except for unexpectedness. But any fan of 1920s film should be glad that he did. Those few memorable seconds introduced many people my age to the world of 1920s cinema. The actual movie Nosferatu is now considered one of the most iconic films of the 20s. And as usual for such a distinction, there are good reasons for that, though it hasn't always had its legendary status. So what was so special about this film? Let's find out. First, let's go through a synopsis of the film. The year is 1838. Our protagonist, Thomas Hutter, usually simply called Hutter, works for a real estate agent in a fictional German town called Visborg. Hutter's boss, Mr. Nock, who was apparently a pretty normal guy before, reads a letter with a lot of symbols and gibberish. Then he starts acting strangely. Nock tells Hutter that a certain Count Orlock wants to purchase a new house, conveniently situated right across the street from Hutter's own house. We can assume that the author of the strange letter was Orlock himself. At one point, Hutter finds a book about Nosferatu, which gives ominous warnings about an evil vampire. That book will come up again later, so don't forget it. Hutter arrives at Orlock's castle and sits down to dinner with his creepy host. While cutting off a piece of bread with a knife, Hutter accidentally slices his thumb and starts bleeding. Count Orlock jumps up at the sight, attracted to the blood like a moth to a flame. Suddenly, he starts to suck Hutter's thumb. Hutter, obviously horrified, retreats to another room and somehow manages to fall asleep. When he wakes up the next morning, he discovers two small bite marks on his neck. We find out through a letter to his wife that he believes they were caused by mosquitoes and does not make the connection with Count Orlock. In another uncomfortable meeting with Orlock that same day, when Hutter is finishing up the necessary paperwork with him, Orlock notices a picture of Hutter's beloved wife, Ellen, remarking that she has a beautiful neck. Come on, Orlock, you're not even trying to hide it. Hutter has some more terrifying experiences while at Orlock's castle, such as when he opened a door to find Orlock staring at him from across the room for no apparent reason other than to be creepy. Back at Hutter's home, his wife Ellen starts behaving very strangely. Previously, she had gotten up from bed and began walking along the balcony railing before being rescued. Then, just as her husband was being crept up on by Orlock, she had a breakdown, trying to warn Hutter about something while the rest of those in the house fear that she is going completely mad. And there is a great film edit here. Although Orlock and Ellen are in different places, Orlock looks off to the right side of the screen, where we then see Ellen in bed, looking as if he can see her, and we can reasonably assume she can see him. Through some more exploring, Hutter finds Orlock sleeping in his wooden coffin in the castle, Shortly afterward, he witnesses Orlock packing up coffins filled with dirt at superhuman speed before getting inside of the top one himself, and we can see more of his psychokinetic abilities through these stop-motion camera techniques. Orlock then transports himself via his carriage to a boat to be shipped off to Visborg. Later aboard the boat, Orlock's presence curses the captain and sailors. Rats spill out of one of the coffins, and soon the sailors start hallucinating and going completely insane. Orlock steers the ship the rest of the way, apparently using his supernatural breath to move faster. When the ship arrives at Visborg, residents find the entire ship's crew dead, and more deaths start to spread through the town. Mr. Nock, Hutter's boss, has gone mad. The town's doctor declares that a plague is, well, plaguing the town, and the citizens must be informed immediately to take precautions. After seeing Orlok's travel preparations, Hutter rushes back to Visborg as quickly as possible and is finally reunited with his wife, Ellen. Meanwhile, Orlok arrives at his new house just across from Hutter's. Instead of opening the door with his mind as he did before, this time he decides to just teleport inside for some reason. 
Mr. Knock escapes from the mental institution where he's being held. He has become a faithful follower of Orlok since reading the strange letter from the beginning of the film. Because of his crazy behavior and outspoken dedication to an evil figure, the townspeople blame him for the plague and chase him all around the town before finally capturing him again. While Hutter is away, Ellen finds the vampire book that he had discovered earlier and brought back with him. The book states that, There is no salvation except that a woman without sin should cause the vampire to forget the first cock crow. Of her own free will, she should give him her blood. Ellen has seen the devastation that Orlok has brought upon the town, so she feels like she must put a stop to it. The next night, as Hutter sleeps, she suddenly wakes up to find Orlok staring at her from his window. She opens her window, signaling that she is ready, and Orlok obliges. She wakes Hutter up, then sends him away for the doctor. While he is doing that, she is faced with Orlok in the most iconic scene in the film. Through the use of only shadows, Orlok is shown slowly going up the stairs, his excessively long, shadowy fingers reaching for the door. He raises his shadow hand to Ellen's heart and quite literally squeezes the life out of her. Although Orlok is satisfied by the blood of a pure maiden, it proves to be his undoing, just like the book had foretold. When the sun rises and the rooster crows, he vanishes and is gone forever, or so we hope. Hutter returns to find Ellen still conscious, but she quickly succumbs. Nock languishes in the insane asylum, broken up about the death of his master. And that's where the film ends. So now, let's talk about the background and context around the film. Originally released in 1922, Nosferatu is one of the prime examples of German Expressionism, an art movement that was spreading around Western Europe in the late 1910s and early 1920s, especially in Germany. Another example in film would be The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, a German film which was released in 1920. Nosferatu was actually a pretty low-budget film, and in fact, it was the only film released by Prana Film, a small studio that went bankrupt shortly after Nosferatu was released. While it wasn't stylized to the extent of The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, Nosferatu still had a rather unique look and feel to it. With its strong German Expressionism influence, the use of distorted shadows in the climactic scene remains unsettling even in the modern day. If you're wondering why Count Orlok bears a striking resemblance to the character Dracula, then I'm sure it won't surprise you to know that there is a direct connection. Count Orlok is based on Bram Stoker's legendary character Count Dracula, originally introduced in his 1897 novel Dracula. The reason why it wasn't just a film about Dracula is often said to be due to avoiding copyright issues, but actually in the German version it clearly stated that it was based on Stoker's novel. The name Nosferatu is often misattributed much in the same way as Frankenstein, which refers to the doctor, not the monster he created. As you heard from the synopsis, the creepy antagonist is Count Orlok. His name is not Nosferatu. The word Nosferatu was apparently a formerly obscure Romanian word meaning vampire, though there are older related words from various ancient languages. Now I'm going to go through some random things that I appreciate about the film. There are a lot of cool little tricks that make for interesting viewing. We saw some of those earlier, the quick stop motion cuts that show Orlok's supernatural powers, and the disappearing trick used when Orlok went inside his new house and again when he died. There was also a very random segment when the carriage was first taking Hutter to Orlok's castle that used the photonegative effect, something that seems to have had no other purpose other than to provide an unexpectedly bizarre look and atmosphere for a few seconds. Then of course, there's the performance of Max Schreck, the actor who played Count Orlok. The fact that the word Schreck in his native German also means terror or fright seems to have provided him a destiny to fulfill. A perfectly mysterious name for someone described as a loner with a peculiar sense of humor in real life. His performance was phenomenal. It was miles ahead of the stereotypical Dracula that became cliche in later decades. Orlok's bushy eyebrows, hook nose, and long lanky body, coupled with his restrained way of moving, really makes for an unsettling character. Roger Ebert described Shrek as playing Orlok more like an animal than human being. Not to mention those long, crooked, claw-like fingers. They really stick out in certain parts. For me, it was when Hutter found Orlok lying in his coffin. Even though he's not moving, those fingers rest on his body, looking very misshapen and disturbing. And of course, when we see his shadow reaching for the door, the fingers getting longer and longer as they inch towards the doorknob. 
and there are quite a few other instances that highlight his weird hands. And of course, it would be a travesty to not talk about the makeup. The makeup is what made the character of Orlok such an enduring image of classic horror. For a comparison, here is what Max Shrek looked like without makeup. Orlok's scrunched, rat-like face, his deathly pale skin completely devoid of all hair other than his eyebrows, makes him look like something truly not of this world. There's also an interesting difference between the acting styles of Gustav von Wagenheim, who played Hutter, and Max Schreck that I think should be noted. Wagenheim's acting is very exaggerated, more in the mold of silent films from the previous decade. The same can be said, to a lesser extent I guess, of Greta Schroeder, who played Ellen. While Schreck's acting style is much more subdued, much more modern most of the time. His movements are subtle and slow. I'm not sure how intentional this juxtaposition was, but I just thought I would mention it. There are other interesting elements of the actual cinematography as well. The cuts are longer than most other movies at that time, a technique that was generally used by those in the German Expressionist school. This is in contrast to certain other influential directors like D.W. Griffith, for example, who favored many shortcuts. The effect that longer cuts often have in Nosferatu is extending the suspense. In some of the more chilling scenes featuring Orlok, the shot is just a bit longer than you would expect. Take again the example of when Orlok is creeping up on Hutter while he's pretending to sleep. The shadow creeps up the wall slowly, then stays there, and stays there, stretching out the fear for a slow, tense burn. There's also the instances of higher camera speed. Let's revisit the scene where Orlok is stacking the coffins. The camera speed is increased to give the effect of Orlok being unnaturally fast, which is in contrast to the normal camera speed throughout the rest of the film. When many people think of silent film, they think of slapstick comedies that were usually sped up for comedic effect. But for a film like Nosferatu, it serves a very different purpose. It was used intentionally to show off Orlok's ability of super speed. We can also see the sped up effect when Hutter is being driven by carriage to Orlok's castle for the first time. Maybe most people today wouldn't see Nosferatu as being that scary. In these early horror films, jump scares were not really a widely used technique because there were a lot of limitations with that. Instead, it's slow, dread inducing, and creepy. Imagine a hundred years ago, with very little precedent for this kind of thing from a visual medium, watching this low budget film from a relatively unknown director. It would certainly have had a different effect. Nonetheless, Nosferatu rightfully remains solidly lodged in the canon of horror films, and will not be leaving anytime soon. But Nosferatu was almost lost forever. The film was undeniably based on the story and characters of Bram Stoker's novel. As I mentioned before, it didn't even try to hide that fact, and was even stated in a title card at the beginning of the German version of the film. This was apparently the fault of Alban Grau, one of the founders of Prana Film, who didn't seem to think it would be an issue. But Bram Stoker's widow and his estate got wind of it and were not happy, proceeding to enact a lawsuit against the makers of the film. Because there was a lot of evidence that the film had purposely intended to use the characters and parts of the story for the film, it was a pretty open and shut case. Stoker's estate won the lawsuit in 1925, roughly three years after the release of Nosferatu, and the court ordered all copies of the film to be destroyed as a consequence. This also spelled the end for the very short-lived Prana film. Fortunately, as has happened quite a few times in history, not every copy was destroyed, and anyone can now enjoy and appreciate it. Nosferatu was well received upon release, but didn't quite have the same initial impact that the cabinet of Dr. Caligari had two years earlier. One copy of Nosferatu had been sent overseas before the court ordered destruction. That copy was copied further, but there were still far less copies of it than of other contemporary films. Partly due to the scarcity of copies in the years after its release, it managed to keep only a small cult following for decades. More money was spent on its promotion and premiere than on the actual making of the film, but this might have saved it in the end. The premiere was a fairly big event and had been advertised for months. If it had had a less impactful start, there might not have been enough interest to keep its legacy hanging by a thread for so long. So after a long and difficult struggle for its continued existence, Nosferatu is now one of the most famous films ever made, and an essential piece of classic horror. The image of Count Orlok is one of the most recognizable in the world of film, and all of those distinctions are well deserved. 
Whether or not you first learned of Nosferatu from that Spongebob episode, you should definitely watch it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Halloween was coming up and this seemed like a fitting topic to cover. I've also uploaded a high quality version of the film for all of you to watch. As usual, it doesn't have music, though you can find many versions with scores specifically made for it. If you wanted to use some other unrelated music, I'd recommend something by Christoph Penderecki. Well, anyway, that's all for now all you Sheiks and Gals out there, but stay tuned for more Tales from the Jazz Age.